I do so thank you for bringing me home. I know, I know. I am a blessing to all who come in contact with me. <laughs> yes, I am a pillar of the church, as everyone knows. Oh my, you shouldn't say that, but you're right. I know, I'm a true gift to Praise Tabernacle. The church would not be what it is today without me. Good night. And this hat is nothing but a covering over my head. It does nothing for my mind. Only the Word of God and the Holy Spirit can do that. And not by osmosis, and not without willingness to change. And this coat, this fancy coat, it covers me, it makes me warm, but it doesn't change my heart attitude or make me more like Christ. It's called obedience, but it's easier said than done. Holiness is to be morally blameless, living a life that is in line with the instructions for moral behavior in scripture. It's not an option. Hebrews tells us without holiness, no one will see the Lord. And that's a sobering thought. But the good news is, the best Christian can never merit salvation through personal holiness, only before God depends entirely on the work of the Spirit. The work of Christ, excuse me. There is a holiness that we have in our, with our standing in God, and a holiness which we're to strive for throughout our daily lives. Beloved, I struggle, as we all do, with walking in a way that pleases God. Almost daily, God is reminding me of areas that I, I need to work on. And as most of you know, I spent six years, I mean six months last year, in a wheelchair with a broken ankle, and went through three operations, and, and had countless hours of time for introspection. And I realized how I had been walking through the motions of Christian life. I'd been saved for like 30 years, and it, sometimes you become, you don't realize it, you become warm. And out of this came the seeds of this message. Thessalonians says, For God did not call us to uncleanness, but to holiness. 1 Corinthians says we're called to be his holy people. Salvation brought with it the Holy Spirit desire to be holy, but it's not a condition for salvation. But because of our sin nature, we have a lifelong struggle with sin. The more we realize and accept the struggle, the better equipped we're going to be to deal with it. It works primarily through our desires. It deceives and distorts our understanding and reasoning. And Satan, whenever possible, does whatever he can to keep us on track with sin. If we don't develop a holy hatred for sin, the deceitfulness in our hearts will allow us to play with temptation. Our thoughts are often something like this. Oh, we can always sin and then, and then confess later and ask forgiveness. And I've been guilty of that one. But if we're consciously thinking about the holiness of the Lord and his absolute hatred for sin, this cannot help us but treat sin lightly. 
will not treat sin lightly. Romans tells us that we must determine ourselves dead to the world of sin. We need to view sin as a separate world, and as believers, we no longer live there anymore. When we give in to temptation, it's because desire has overcome our reason in the battle to influence our wills. We must learn to be obedient and depend on the Holy Spirit to guide and to direct us. We must get our thought life in order and be on guard, constantly defeating the enemy as we choose to walk pleasing God. We often say we're defeated by this sin or that sin. Sounds like the sin did it. But it's not the sin, it's our disobedience causing that sin. The point is the Holy Spirit has given us the power to live a holy life by prayer and the word and being obedient to his teachings. But we must make the effort. He will give us what we need to make the right choices, but we must ultimately choose to be obedient. We must not think, I just can't do it, but rather I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. John tells us obedience is the pathway to holiness. We must be persuaded that a holy life is God's will for every Christian and know that it's doable and the best life we can possibly have. And there we will find our joy in our life. Memorizing scripture is one of the most effective ways to influence our minds. And the goal of memorization is to apply scripture to our daily lives. Sorry. My hands are shaking. We are to train ourselves to be godly, and in 1 Timothy tells us, reject profane and old wives' fables and exercise yourself toward godliness. And most of these things we do at uh, some degree or another, hearing the word of God talked by reputable teachers and, and preachers and pastors, reading the Bible for ourselves, studying and memorizing scriptures, and meditating what we've, on what we've heard, studied, and memorized. But then the hard part, we have to apply it. The truth is, the more we see the holiness of God and his word revealed to us, the more we recognize how far short we fall. And this is an eye-opening experience, but must not prevent us from persevering, even if it seems the gap is widening. And this has been the Holy Spirit's way of drawing and progressing me towards Jesus. At times, he's let me see just how wretched that I am. I recognize how far I have to go to be holy as he's holy, and I will be working on it for a lifetime. It makes me feel sometimes like a speck of dust, but in a good way. You see, I also understand it's the fear of God, that trembling awareness of his holiness that I feel this way. I recognize who God really is, his power, in comparison to who I am and makes me not want to give up because I know these feelings are the Holy Spirit's way of making me more hungry and more determined to pick myself up and continue on the path to being more like him. You see, our will ultimately determines our choices. True holiness includes control over the physical bodies and appetites. Our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, and we are to glorify God with them. 1 Corinthians 29 through 24 through 27, do you not know that those who run in the race all run, but one receives the prize? But in such a way that you may obtain it, run. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate, which means self-restrained and not extreme in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we do it for an imperishable crown. As an aside, I, I of course looked up the crowns, but I don't have time to go into all of them, but I, uh, the imperishable crown is also called the incorruptible crown. And that crown is given to a believer who faithfully runs the race, who crucifies every selfish desire in the flesh and points man to Jesus. Some are called to the things that require sacrifice in the way that they live and conduct their lives, such as missionaries, or working for almost nothing in earthly terms. 
continuing with 1 Corinthians, it says, therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not with one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and I bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Gluttony and laziness were regarded by the early Christians as sin. Today we often look at those two things as weaknesses of the will, but certainly not sin. We need to examine ourselves as to whether we eat and drink to the glory of God, recognizing our bodies are temples. And in regards to the body, I have my weaknesses, which makes this an area something I'd rather not even talk about tonight or shed any light. But Satan likes to keep everything in the dark. And we must bring it to the light to overcome. And because bringing it to light is one of the first steps in overcoming. And I recognize that I must have control over my indulgence of food and drink because it represents one of the primary natural appetites. And anyone who overindulges his body will find it more and more difficult to abstain from other sinful deeds of the body. We must watch what we put into our bodies that don't glorify God. Paul also mentions greed, the sheer love of money and possessions and power and as a sin. It's idolatry. We're putting these things before our relationship with God. We most often see it manifest in materialism. And materialism makes us discontented and envious of others. It leads us to pamper and indulge our bodies that so we become soft and lazy. These instincts and passions of the body can dominate our thoughts and our actions. For most of my life, I struggled with the overwhelming desire to have possessions. My lack in childhood was a factor in that unquenchable thirst. I wanted a beautiful home and everything inside to be absolute perfection. And I know now it was to fill the emptiness that I had inside. At every turn in my life, that desire was not met. I believe God was working in my, in my life, now that, that I'm older I realize, a lesson of priorities. Nothing, knowing what is really important and what is not important. I met Jesus in 1978, and 23 years went by after 30 years of marriage, I got a divorce in 2001. And then I had to take care of myself in every way. I hadn't worked since I, I, before I was married. And I had to learn to take care of, my, of myself and my, uh, uh, completely. But all those years, that desire for beautiful possessions still had not been gratified. In fact, it was so bad I came close to losing my home as we were behind in payments and there was a threat of, of foreclosure. And during my divorce, and while I attended computer school, I worked for Barbara Perry cleaning her houses and was collecting federal government food stamps to get by until I started to work full time. And through that struggle, the Lord eventually granted me my desire in the midst of all those stressful, stressful changes. And today I do have a beautiful home. But ultimately, I found emptiness in it. It didn't fill that void in my heart from the pain of the past. I finally realized that was so much more important things in life than things. And it was interesting, when I was writing this, th there was a song that came into my mind, and this is something that the Lord does to me. Old songs, new songs, even in the world songs, and, and they have something in them that tells me something, or you know, gives me some idea. He teaches me through them. It's, it's just amazing sometimes, some of the funny ones where he makes me laugh, you know. But this particular one, just the Holy Spirit just came over me, and it's a song that you all know, but I'm just gonna say the words. Maybe they'll touch you too, because we all know this song. But after saying all of this about what he had done in my life, he said, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of this world will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. I want to be like him. And that's where I'm finding my joy, not in the material things that God has blessed me with. And one place we can start controlling the cravings of our physical appetites is to reduce our exposure to the temptation. 
Romans tells us, do not think about how to gratify the desires of your sinful nature. But fortunately for me, I didn't have the time. I had to get out there and learn how to take care of myself financially while trying to walk with the Lord wholeheartedly. Philippians tells us to think on things that are lovely and pure and right and noble, praiseworthy and excellent. We must learn to bring ourselves thought lives captive to the obedience of Christ. If we don't, the result is garbage in and garbage out. What we do allow ourselves to see, what do we, what do we watch on television? Who do we allow ourselves to listen to? Not those, just those negative around us, but the enemy. They can distort our mind and change our thinking. And what comes out of our mouths? Garbage out. Matthew says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And in James 3, 5 through 10, it tells you all about the evil of your tongue. I'm just going to read the portions about the, the tongue. Just, it's, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, but full of deadly poison. And with it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men. And out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. Instead of garbage in and garbage out, we need our tongue to be godliness in and godliness out. In 1 Corinthians it says, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have received from God. You are not your own. There is something amazingly, wonderfully, unbelievably special about the actual body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Did it radiate with light as he walked among men? Could it be in two places at one time? Did it have a halo over his head? No, it was none of those things. Was it different from the bodies of other men? Not really. Just like our bodies, it was fearfully and wonderfully made. His body had two feet, two hands, two eyes, two ears, a head, a mouth, and a heart. Yet it was different. The Lord Jesus Christ's body was special because the Son of a God assumed it and to dwell on, here on earth among men. It was through a, a body that was indwelt by the Holy Spirit and dedicated to the will that Jesus carried on in his ministry. It wasn't tainted with sin. There was no sin in him. No deception in his mouth. The power of the highest overshadowed Mary and the infant Jesus was born sinless. And in similar fashion, every Christian's body is special too. No, we weren't conceived without sin. Our bodies don't glow in the dark. We can't last very long without food and water. We can't jump 10 feet or skip 30. Nor can we pass through closed doors or be in two places at the same time. But they are special. Like Jesus, they were fearfully and wonderfully made. And our bodies belong to the Lord. This is what makes them special. Jesus bought us with a price by the shedding of his own precious blood. We became a Christian by trusting in the atoning death of Jesus Christ on the cross. And the Holy Spirit entered into our bodies. That's an awesome thing. And at that very moment, our body became the very temple of God. So our bodies are sacred. They're special. And 1 Corinthians 6.19 says, Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit which is in you, which you have of God. And you are not your own, for you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. 
in this, Paul suggests four things. It serves us as a reminder of what? Know ye not? This expression is used by Paul eight times in this first letter to Corinthians. Again and again he had to say to them, know you not? Another way to say it, didn't anyone ever tell you about these things? Haven't you been informed? Don't you know it's wrong to pit one preacher against another? Wrong to organize yourselves into cliques and be constantly at war with each other? Don't you know that spirits are disrupting the harmony of the church, creating deep feelings of animosity and hostility? Don't you know that drunkards, fornicators, adulterers, and sex perverts shall not inherit the kingdom of God? And don't you know that your body was purchased by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, that you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and that God wants to use it for his glory? So could it be that the Christians at Corinth did not know better and had to be informed? They'd been saved from heathenism, superstition, and loose moral living. Perhaps they didn't really know how to behave as Christians. Or could it be that the Corinthians were ignoring the information that was given to them? They knew what was expected, but they were doing nothing about it. They were not living up to their potential in Christ. They were not growing. They were not obeying Christ. They were living too close to the world, attracted by its allure. Their separation wasn't complete. The world, the flesh, and the devil still had a hold on him. I read that there was a woman who was 45 years of age, and she still had the voice and the body of a child. And spiritually speaking, the Corinthians were like that. Their souls had not kept pace with their age as Christians. They had been Christians for years, but had been stifled in their growth. And Paul wanted to, to feed them the meat of God's word, but he had to feed them with baby food instead because they refused nourishment. They had been Christians for years, but had been stifled in their growth. I'm sorry. Paul had to remind them that their bodies were special unto God. And since the Holy Spirit had been deposited in their lives, all their faculties were meant to be holy unto the Lord. They were to be set apart for his glory and for his honor. And second, Paul emphasizes that they were a retainer. Retainer meaning holding something. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit which is in you? In the Old Testament, God instructed Moses to build the tabernacle in the wilderness. There was something about the tabernacle which distinguishes it, Judaism, from all other religions of that time. What was it? We all know there was a supernatural occupant in that tabernacle. Other religions were merely man-made, counterfeits. Judaism had the real thing. The presence of God actually indwelt the tabernacle. And this is what made the tabernacle a special place of worship. And after that, the Temple of Solomon came. After its completion, Solomon dedicated it with these words, Behold the heaven, and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you, how much less this house that I have built. Solomon wisely realized that his beautiful temple had limitations. He knew that God was bigger than anything that he could make. The temple was dedicated to God in a very special way. It became his dwelling place. And at his dedication, the Shekinah glory, the visible manifestation of filled the house. And God was there. And both of these structures housed the presence of God. Paul reminded the Christians that they, their bodies were temples of God. And they understood him. Most of us have too small an understanding of what it means to really be indwelt by the Holy Spirit. We take it for granted. I know that I have. Their heathen city had many shrines which housed man-made gods. 
and here was a new conception of life, the body as a shrine of God. It was no longer a sacred building where God dwelt. It was a sacred body. They were carrying around in their bodies the presence of the Holy Spirit. And no matter where they went or what they were doing, consciously or unconsciously, they took God with them, just as our bodies. And third, Paul mentions that they were receivers. What? Know you not that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit which is in you, which you have of God? The body of the believer comes at the moment of regeneration, the temple of the Holy Spirit. He comes to indwell us and to make our bodies sacred habitations. That means devoted to deity. And the secret of it is he places his Holy Spirit within us, making us new creatures with new desires and motives and interests. And all things are passed away and all things become new. And the Spirit of God now resides within us. It's easy to allow habits and practices and ways of life to control and to master us. But the spirit we have received provides the strength to master them. We're no, no longer enslaved by the appetite of the flesh, our instincts or our desires. We can now yield ourselves to the one who can do exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond what we can even imagine or think. I read of an elderly saint who was being taken to his burial and he had been very poor and with great haste they were moving his coffin to the grave when a wise old minister said, tread softly, you are carrying a temple of the Holy Spirit. It's really hit me how unbelievable it is that the Holy Spirit himself lives in us. I didn't really get the gravity of that statement and I'm still coming to terms with it. The Holy Spirit himself abides in us to glorify Christ, our Savior. And he takes the things of Christ and makes them meaningful to us. He leads us in our daily living that we may grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord. And as we yield our lives completely to him, he fills us with his glory. Can you believe he actually fills little old us with his glory, God's glory? And fourth, Paul speaks of us as revealers. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own, for you were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Here we have the purpose for which we were indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Our bodies are special because they were indwelt by the Holy Spirit. They've been purchased by the precious blood of Jesus, and they were meant to glorify him. Paul had to remind the Christians that their bodies were sacred because they were using them in immoral ways. Prostitution, fornication, adultery, and even that which is contrary to nature. Venus was the principal deity worshipped in the city of Corinth. She was a goddess of love, of sexual unrestrained passion. And the people of the city were devoted to her so you can imagine the results. Her shrine appeared above those of other gods and it was a law that 1,000 beautiful girls should officiate at pub as public prostitutes at the altar of the goddess of evil. So even Christians were being influenced. They too were guilty of sex abuses. And Paul said, glorifying God with your body. The Greeks, however, looked down on the body among them was a saying that the body is a tomb. To them, the important thing was the soul, the spirit man. The body was a thing that didn't matter. Being of this persuasion meant you could do as you pleased with your body. And they believed if the soul is all that matters, then what a person does with the body is of no significance. After all, if a Christian is the freest of people, then he is, not, is he not free to do what he likes? If a man is made for a sexual act, then a sexual act is made for the body. Therefore, let the desires of the body have their way. 
just as you do when you feed your stomach in response to hunger. But Paul made it clear their concept was totally wrong. Man as a whole will not pass away. He is made for union with Christ in this world. And this being the case, a body which belongs to Christ has been literally prostituted to the one to whom the sex has been committed. He proclaims that of all sins, fornication is the one that affects a person's body and insults it. This means we must keep it clean and pure and practice holy living. Remember, your body belongs to God. And it says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And some versions say, worship. So how does holiness happen? If, is it believing that God will lead us down the path to holiness? It's done by moving forward in obedience with the goal, like Jesus, reaching closer and closer to moral excellence, as we talked about from scripture. We must apply what we know the Bible has given us to help us towards that goal. And we must listen to the Holy Spirit as he guides and he directs us. If I don't, it's going to be 10 years later, and I'm going to be the same person, still desiring to work with God, walk with God, but, but no further along in holiness. I want to be obedient to his call to be holy as he is holy. And then I can say, he can say to me, well done, good and faithful servant. This is my desire, not because I have to, but because I love him and I desire to fulfill his mandate for, for my life. It's not what I wish my reputation was, it's what my character is. We need a heart change and perseverance to hang in there and know that God is pleased with us each step we conquer and move towards the goal of being more like him. We need a deeper reverence and respect for all that he is, not an outward show. It, takes, it starts with inward purity. When we don't, it hurts the very heart of God. We want to be a blessing to our Father in heaven. The feet of God, the feet that led you in sin should now be directed in paths of righteousness. To the house of God, in the place of prayer. The eyes that once looked upon things which violated the law of God should now be directed to the Savior. The ears that once listened to impure things should now be eager to, to hear the word of God, the word of life. And the hands that once were swift to shed innocent blood should now be engaged in the service to the Lord. The tongue that once talked so loosely and glibly should now be singing his praises and telling others of his great love. And the heart that was set upon earthly things should now be embracing the things of Christ, sharing his love to men everywhere. Oh, that a holy woman would arise in me, that the woman I am would cease to be. And one of the reasons that I really felt strong about needing to come up here and talk about holiness is because I have this something going on inside of me that I know that revival is about to take off. Amen. And because of it, we need to be ready. We must be ready in this season as revival is. It's at our door. And many are going to be coming in. And they're going to be, need discipling and teaching and mentoring. And we need to be in a place where we can do these things because we come from the right place of holiness. We need to be walking in a way that glorifies God and honors him and all that we say and do so that we can pass it on to others and they pass it on to others to be a picture of Jesus Christ. One thing I've found that whenever God comes to teach, I've always believed that it's unto something. The Holy Spirit has a purpose for the teaching. And often he wants to do something. And on Sunday, it was the, October the 27th in the, in the service, 
It was a late service at church. And during the worship, I, the Lord showed me, he displayed something to me from the Holy Spirit. I saw you just as I'm seeing you now. But what I saw that was different was that you had candles in your hand. And some of them were unlit. And some of them had a small flame. And some of them had larger flames. I believe God wants to come bef you to come before his throne to receive a candle as a symbol of your desire to walk in holiness. He is here to ignite that flame for the first time, once more, or increase it, what's already in your heart. Christ himself has exhorted us to let our light shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. And I believe this exercise is symbolic of you giving yourself over to this purpose. He desires to make you a mighty flame for him. And a reminder of your decision this night to begin to walk in holiness.